The year is 1978. Grease and Animal House are two of the highest grossers of the year. This couldn't be further from the current era of superhero films reigning supreme over the box office. But what's that up in the sky? It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's... Superman? Huh. Been a while. With everything that the DC Cinematic Universe has become over the last decade, it felt like time to go way back to the films that started it all. So we're going back to the beginning and revisiting all the colorful spandex, flamboyant villains, and A-listers along the way. First up, we've got the one that started it all with DC Revisited Superman. DC Comics has had a slew of successful superheroes over the years. They pop from the page with their bright colors, and the time had come to see them on the big screen. While lesser serials had been released prior, the most successful of which being the Adam West starring Batman the movie, it was finally time for a bigger superhero on the screen. Enter Superman, and enter young entrepreneur Ilya Salkind. Salkind, a Mexican producer following in the family business, joined forces with his father Alexander and Pierre Spangler to purchase the film rights to Superman in 1974. Salkind's grand plan was to film the first two Superman films back to back. This meant a longer shooting schedule, but massive sets like the Fortress of Solitude wouldn't need to be stored in between films or entirely rebuilt from scratch. So the plan seemed foolproof. Salkin just needed a director that could manage his vision or more appropriately, the budget. The total budget for the film was set at $55 million, which translates to over $200 million when adjusting for inflation. So this was a very big gamble, especially since superheroes were not the known commodity that they are now. And seeing as how they weren't exactly established, there weren't any directors to go to that had immediate first-hand knowledge on how to properly make this kind of film. Given the innovation needed, Salkin looked to James Bond mainstay Guy Hamilton to direct the feature. The deal fell apart, however, when production for the film moved to Pinewood Studios in England. And why exactly the move from Cinecita Studios in Rome? Because star Marlon Brando had a warrant out for his arrest, so therefore could not be in Italy to film. Yeah, quite the conundrum. Adding to the confusion was Hamilton's recent tax exile status meaning he was not allowed in England for more than 30 days, which would have put the production in a very bad place. He was promptly replaced by Richard Donner, whose recent film, The Omen, was a massive success. Mario Puzo, David Newman, Leslie Newman, Robert Benton, and Tom Mankiewicz all had their hands in writing the screenplay. With these being the writers of such classics as The Godfather, Bonnie and Clyde, and Live and Let Die, the movie was off to a great start. At least, that's how it would appear. Puzo's script was deemed to be too long and detailed, so he left after a second draft, losing interest in the character. Benton and David Newman were then brought on to rewrite Puzo's script and break it into two films. Due to Benton's commitments to The Late Show, Newman's wife Leslie was brought in as his writing partner. Considered much more modern and filled with campy humor, the main problem still persisted. The script was too long. When Donner came aboard as director, he brought Mankiewicz with him to rewrite the script. The WGA was strict about not having more than four writers on the movie. He was relegated to the position of creative consultant, despite the fact that, in his own words, he didn't use a word from the prior screenplays. But with the reworked screenplay by Mankiewicz, Donner could now get to work finding his Superman. The list of studio-approved actors that were considered for the lead role is a who's who of Hollywood, with such giants as Al Pacino, James Caan, Steve McQueen, and Dustin Hoffman. But the glamour of getting into skin-tight spandex was still a few decades off, so most were uninterested. Once the hiring process started, an official offer was given to Robert Redford, which he turned down. This continued with Burt Reynolds. Eventually, Paul Newman was offered $4 million to take on either Superman, Lex Luthor, or Superman's father, Jor-El. But still, the offer was declined. Getting an A-lister just wasn't in the cards. So instead, the focus shifted towards finding an unknown and populating some of the other roles with big names. After seeing hundreds of auditions, Christopher Reeve, 
who had only appeared on TV shows like Love of Life and The Wide World of Mystery, had managed to impress producers enough to win the role. He had both the physical attributes and a certain boyish charm when playing Clark. Oddly enough, in order to get into proper Superman-level shape, Reeve entered into a bodybuilding program supervised by none other than the physical form of Darth Vader himself, David Prowse. Results that clearly paid off. Marlon Brando was cast as Kal-El's father, Jor-El. And like many roles before it, Brando brought his interesting way of doing things. He notoriously wanted to do as little work as possible on set, even convincing Richard Donner to film during the rehearsal takes. That's not even getting into his salary, which started at three and a half million, but was increased after disputes with the producers that had him removed from the second film. In a somewhat odd move, Jeff East was cast as a young Clark Kent, despite being only five years younger than Reeve. Why not just have Christopher Reeve play the high school role as well with a little bit of makeup? Adding to the confusion, Reeve dubbed over all of East's dialogue, so you never once hear Jeff's voice in the film. To make matters worse, producers never informed East of this during filming. It's an odd decision, but it's honestly really hard to notice and works fairly well, all things considered. Is it showing off and somebody's doing the things he's capable of doing? Oh, and I'm not going to criticize the fact that these teenagers look like they're about 30. Have you seen teenagers from this era? They look about 40, so if anything, this is a win. Going back to the Kent farm, Glenn Ford and Phyllis Thaxter starred as Clark's parents, Jonathan and Martha. They're the two that shape who Clark is, so their conveyance of all things good is pretty pivotal to the story. And given that this period is given the least amount of screen time, they really needed to make an impact early, and they nailed it. When we get to the Daily Planet, there's a whole slew of fascinating characters, each one more interesting than the last. You've got the boss, Perry White, played expertly by Jackie Cooper. He's a fast talker whose command of the Daily Planet newsroom makes the hierarchy clear without a word needing to be spoken. Then there's teenage photographer Jimmy Olsen. While Olsen was Mark McClure's most famous role, some of you may remember him as Marty's brother in Back to the Future. And last but not least, star reporter Lois Lane, played expertly here by Margot Kidder. Kidder had been in films such as 92 in the Shade and the phenomenal Black Christmas. Here she gave Lois all the qualities we would grow to love, her fierceness, her loyalty to the truth, and her puppy dog love for Superman. It's a great performance and there's electricity whenever Reeve and Kidder are on screen together. Their famous flying scene is one of the most magical of the movie and leaves a massive impression. Taking on the part of Superman's arch nemesis Lex Luthor was Gene Hackman, known for movies such as The Poseidon Adventure, The Conversation, and The French Connection. Luthor is Superman's greatest villain, so to have an actor the caliber of Hackman to encompass him is a dream come true. Unfortunately, Hackman didn't quite see the role like it was in the comics. Or rather, he didn't like the look. Refusing to wear a bald cap until the final scene of the movie, Donner instead opted to style Jean's hair in various ways, to make it appear like different wigs were in different states of dishevelment. The illusion works fairly well. Working alongside Lex Luthor is his assistant slash love interest, Eve Tessmacher. Valerie Perrin stands out because she feels like more than just Lex's girlfriend. In fact, she's pretty vital to the story. Finally, we've got Ned Beatty playing Otis, who may be just the dumbest oaf of a henchman out there. How Luthor puts up with him, I'll never know. If you've never seen Superman, the story is simple enough. Young Kal-El escapes his dying planet of Krypton and crash lands in rural Kansas. Now Clark Kent, he's raised to be a good person and sets off to use his Kryptonian powers for the good of humanity. Only he's got one really big problem. Lex Luthor. See, Luthor is all about money and power and going about getting them in not-so-honest ways. You can see why he wouldn't be a fan of soups. Like any good villain, he has a plan to kill Superman with his one weakness, Kryptonite. That way, he can set off a massive bomb on the San Andreas fault line, sending the coast of California into the ocean, and making way for a new beachfront, all owned by LexCorp. It's honestly pretty genius. I'll bite completely insane. In the midst of Luthor's crazy scheme, he manages to get Lois Lane killed. 
This is when we find out that Superman doesn't just have super strength, super speed, bulletproof skin, the ability to fly, laser eyes, x-ray vision, and freeze breath. He can also turn back time. And how does he do that? Well, he flies ridiculously fast around Earth, which causes time to go backwards. Because that's how things work in this world. And God bless him for it. We get the very storybook ending of Superman saving the day and dropping Lex Luthor off at prison. Oh, and we finally get a look at Lex in his full bald glory. Thank God for bald caps. Superman saved the day, and the bad guy has been defeated. It's the most good versus evil way of storytelling out there, and that's why it works so much. Heck, that's why the Superman character as a whole works so much. Because sometimes, we just really want to see something good and pure doing what's right. When it comes to the visuals, there were loads of amazing effects work done in the film. Take this shot of a young Clark kicking a football into the stratosphere. These days it would have been entirely CGI, but here, they actually stuck a cannon in the ground and then shot the ball out of the sky. It's extremely impressive. Then there's the flying, which pretty much became the standard for any sort of flying scene from here on out, with its dynamic movement. No more just hanging still in front of a projector anymore. That's not to say there weren't issues, all of these effects meant problems, which often meant delays. John Williams has created some of the most instantly recognizable scores ever, and Superman is no exception. The opening credits, as well as this theme over top of it, is absolutely iconic in every way. While the studio wanted the film to release in the summer months, preferably in June for the character's 40th anniversary, the massive delays in filming pushed the film to December. This delay also meant that they abandoned their plan to film the sequel along with the first film, despite the fact that they filmed over 75% of it. But just focusing on the original film, they were able to push through and make its December date. When it finally made its debut, it broke various profit records for Warner Brothers. And it wasn't just audiences that were enamored. Critics loved it. In 2021 speak, it had a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is rarefied air. Superman's success actually carried over into awards season. The amazing special effects of Superman were awarded with a Special Achievement Academy Award for Visual Effects. Unfortunately, despite its nominations for Best Film Editing, Best Sound, and Best Original Score, this was the only award the film received from the Academy. For many years, Superman was the benchmark for how to do a comic book movie right. Christopher Reeve is Superman. Every person to play the role since has been compared to him, some entirely basing their performance off of his. But it's not just his Superman that's so special. The boyish charm he displays as Clark Kent, and shy body language are such a contrast to the cape-doning superhero that you totally buy into the fact that no one recognizes that these two people are the same. 50 years from now, people will still be comparing whoever is playing Superman at the time back to Christopher Reeve. In the years since, a three-hour television version was released that included extra scenes, but this version has been admonished by its director, Richard Donner, who refers to this version as nothing more than a work print. Some fans, however, absolutely love this cut. It gives you a little bit more insight into the character of Superman, and honestly just gives you some really fun moments. None of these scenes are what you would call pivotal to the story, so it's easy to see why Donner isn't a fan of them. However, with how much they add dimensions to the characters, it's also easy to see why fans have latched onto this cut of the film. While it was only available in full screen for many years, fan demand and the luck of finding the original negative allowed Warner Brothers to release a fully restored extended cut on Blu-ray. The cast of the film has shown up in various DC projects in the years since. Reeve, Kidder, and McClure all showed up on the Superman origin show Smallville as various roles unrelated to their prior characters. Footage of Brando that was shot for Superman 2 was eventually used for Brian Singer's Superman Returns in 2006, which saw a return to the world of the first two Superman films. This year even saw the release of the comic book, Superman 78, which exists in the world of Reeves Superman, and gives us more insight into the world molded by Richard Donner. Given Donner's unfortunate passing this year, it's a wonderful tribute to both the director and all of the deceased stars from the film, like Reeve and Kidder. Despite it being 43 years since its release, Superman is as timeless as ever. That's due in equal parts to its wonderful direction by Donner, the stellar performances from Reeve, Kidder, and Hackman, 
and those never-before-seen special effects. They all combine to make one of the greatest comic book movies ever made. With all of the success of the original, there was still the matter of that pesky sequel that was already 75% filmed. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Kneel before Zod! The controversy surrounding Superman 2 is the stuff of legend. One of the biggest and most respected directors being replaced partway through production? Scandalous. Yet even with these circumstances, the film still managed to be one of the better superhero films for decades. Would you care to step outside? Today, we're getting into it all in DC Revisited, Superman 2. Fans of Superman have always had an obsession with this film, and with good reason. What other films do you know where the director was replaced in lieu of having a lighter... tone? Oh, something's definitely bleeding. Okay, maybe it's not so uncommon, but this was the first instance of fans willing a new cut of a priorly completed film into existence. But in order to discuss these different versions, we must first go back to the production of the first film. The original plan was to film Superman and its sequel back to back. Given the extensive delays due to the technical skill required, the decision was made to stop filming the sequel and just focus on completing the first film. This proved to be a good decision, with Superman making a mint at the box office and leaving audiences wanting more. So you would think that the path of least resistance would be to have everyone return to finish the remaining 25% of the sequel. Sounds logical. Only one problem. The Salkines and Pierre Spangler did not get along with original director Richard Donner. In fact, it had gotten so bad that they hired Richard Lester as an intermediary between the producers and Donner during the first film, as they were not on speaking terms. Thanks for watching DZ Films Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video comes up. Now, back to the show. According to Variety, Pierre Spangler was actually looking forward to working with Donner on the sequel. When Donner got word of this, he said, If he's on it, I'm not. The main issue came from Donner's perceived lack of creative control. He wanted full control to make the movie that he wanted, but the producer still wanted a say, given that it was their money invested in the project. Never coming to an agreement, Richard Lester was chosen as Donner's replacement given his prior involvement with the project. Given Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder's close relationship with Richard Donner, neither seemed happy about the switch in directors. Adding to the frustration was the filming schedule, which changed when the plan to make both films back-to-back -back was abandoned, causing issues with Reeve's new film, Somewhere in Time. To compensate him, producers gave Reeve a better back-end deal as well as more creative control. While Reeve had been mostly diplomatic regarding the replacement over the years, Kidder on the other hand has not, often lambasting Lester for his creative decisions. The fallout from Donner's firing was immediate, with several key creative members refusing to return. Gene Hackman, having developed a close friendship with Donner, declined to return for any of the reshoots. Because of this, they had to work with the prior footage, as well as use a voice and body double. It's quite obvious in spots. Each one totally dedicated to corruption, violence, and evil. Creative consultant Tom Mankiewicz, who, if you watched our last video, you'll know was the main writer on the original film, also declined to come back out of loyalty to Donner. But it wasn't just because of Donner that certain creative elements failed to return. Cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth had passed away just before release. Set designer John Barry, who collapsed on the Empire Strikes Back set, died from meningitis. So the look of Superman was set to drastically change. The main issue that the Selkines had with replacing Donner is that Donner had already filmed 75% of the movie. If they were to reuse all of that footage, they would need to give him credit on the film based on Directors Guild rules. In order for Richard Lester to receive proper credit, he needed to have filmed 40% of what ended up on screen. So they instead had Lester go back and film scenes again, changing them ever so slightly. 
It makes for some really arbitrary changes, most of them lesser than what was originally shot. But the biggest problem with Lester's vision for the film is that it directly conflicted with Donner's. And given that a majority of the footage used would still be from Donner, it caused some strange inconsistencies. Lester had said that, There was a kind of David Leanish attempt in several sequences, and enormous scale. There was a type of epic quality, which isn't in my nature. So my work really didn't embrace that. That's not me. So all those dynamic shots from the first film that were meant to add scale, replaced with static shots that Lester felt more resembled a comic book panel. Even scenes that Donner originally shot were color timed in such a way that it took away from the original work that Barry and Unsworth did. Not to mention all of the continuity issues between Reeve and Kidder in this scene alone. Thankfully, most of the cast from the first film returned to their roles here. The main group we need to discuss is the Kryptonian terrorists. As introduced by Jor-El, we have Nan. This mindless aberration, whose only means of expression are wanton violence and destruction. Ursa. His perversions and unreasoning hatred of all mankind have threatened even the children of the planet Krypton. And General Zod. Chief architect of this intended revolution and author of this insidious plot to establish a new order amongst us, with himself as absolute ruler. These are our big villains of the piece and provide us with some of the best moments of the entire film. Not only are they equal matches to Superman, but there are three of them. Really ups the stakes from the first one. The basic story between the two versions is essentially the same. Clark still wants to leave his life of Superman behind him to be with Lois, and Zod, Nan, and Ursa are still terrorizing Earth. It's just the little details and order of events that are different, but those little moments really add up for an entirely different tone. We'll refer to Richard Lester's version as the theatrical cut and the Richard Donner version as the Donner cut. First, the beginning of the film is entirely different. Superman stops a group of terrorists in France, saves the day, and sends the bomb out through the top of the Eiffel Tower and out into space. This bomb explodes and releases Zod, Nan, and Ursa out of their imprisoned state in the Phantom Zone. In Donner's version, we simply get a replay of the end of Superman 1, with Supes capturing the rocket and sending it out into space. This time, however, we follow it and see that when it explodes, it releases the imprisoned Kryptonians. While the connection to the first film is nice, it does feel a little, why am I watching this? So not all of the Donner content is preferred. But sometimes the differences were absolutely paramount. You may have noticed that Marlon Brando doesn't appear in the theatrical version of Superman 2. This is due to his contract dispute with Warner Brothers that resulted in a lawsuit. Due to this, no footage of him was allowed to be used. That means the beginning portion with the trial on Krypton had to be entirely reshot without Brando. Not only that, but young Kal-El being sent away also needed to be reshot with just Lara L. Lara replaces Jor-El in any of the instances where he was intended to show up. It's very confusing since, to this point, Jor-El is the main connection that Clark has with Krypton. Thankfully, by the time the Donner Cut was released, Brando had long since settled his dispute, so Donner was able to use his footage as originally intended. This meant that the opening was near identical to the opening of the original film, and the instances of Clark interacting with the Fortress of Solitude are now back to Brando instead of Susanna York. It really helps bridge the two films in a natural way. Another major change is the scene at Niagara Falls. The oddest aspect of this is that it appears to be entirely ADR'd. I can give you a hand if you have trouble lifting. Uh... Oh, no, of course not. Honey, hmm? thanks, I'll walk. Certainly, dear. It makes the moment feel very artificial. While the interactions between Clark and Lois are much more natural in the Donner cut, the biggest issue is how Lois finds out Clark is Superman. She shoots at him with a gun. Sure, it's revealed shortly after that it was just a blank, but regardless, it makes Lois look like a crazy person. But this is the same woman who threw herself out the window to prove that Clark is Superman, and failing to do so. 
So I suppose that anything is possible. One aspect that really doesn't work in either version is how quickly Clark goes from powerless to realizing he needs his power again to defeat Zod. The diner scene where he gets beaten up by a trucker named Rocky is our only time being able to see him in this weakened state, because then he's off to get his powers back to try and defeat the Kryptonians. It feels very short-sighted. Otherwise, it's mostly the order of events that are changed between the two versions. The ending is where we see a pretty big departure yet again. In the original theatrical version, Superman defeats the Kryptonians and heads back to Metropolis with Lois, who's upset that she can't cope with Clark's true identity and her love for him. This is where Superman introduces the strangest power yet, outside of his cellophane cape. The ability to wipe someone's memory with simply a kiss. Now, before people get too upset, this is actually a power that Superman has in the comics. It's established in Action Comics 306, so this isn't something completely out of left field. However, the power was retconned in the 80s, so it clearly didn't have many fans. Meanwhile, in the Donner version, we have Clark making the rough decision to undo his relationship with Lois, while simultaneously undoing all the damage that Zod and his cronies caused on Earth. It effectively means that none of the film actually happened, but it also kept Zod and the others alive with the potential to be used in the future. Neither ending is fully satisfying, and there will always be fans on either side of the aisle. But given the time travel, things get a little bit confusing with Clark returning to the diner in the end. This trucker has no idea who Clark is. Neither do these people. So it really just looks like Clark is a big bully for no reason. At least the theatrical version had some context. As production wrapped, no mention was made of the controversy with Donner. Specials were produced at the time that made it seem as though it was just a regular Hollywood production, which it was clearly anything but. Due to Directors Guild rules, Donner had still contributed to 60% of the film, and therefore needed to be listed as a co-director. Lester approached Donner about being listed as a co-director on the film, to which Donner reportedly said, I don't share credit. Given that the theatrical version was not his intended vision, Donner had no issue giving up credit, so Richard Lester is solely credited in the poster and in the movie. After viewing an early cut of the film, composer John Williams felt he could no longer contribute to the project after the massive change in direction. Because of this, Williams was replaced by Ken Thorne, who had won an Oscar for the film. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Despite this accolade, the score really suffered due to the lack of Williams at the helm. Even the parts of Williams' score that Thorne recreated packed much less oomph. Likely because they were recorded with a studio orchestra rather than the London Symphony Orchestra, like in the first film. Thankfully, William's score was reused for the Donner cut. Always wanting to optimize box office receipts, producers looked to release the film at different times of the year depending on the territory's most popular times for moviegoing. That meant that the film released in Australia on December 4th, 1980, and then in the UK on Easter of 1981. By the time the film actually released in the United States on June 19th, it was well behind the rest of the world. Despite this, Superman 2 was a massive success, breaking records with a first day gross of 4.3 million. Audiences and critics took to it for how much it upped the stakes from the first film. We're no longer just getting Superman stopping crimes and disasters we finally get to see him battle with people with similar powers. It truly felt like a comic book coming to life, and audiences responded with a final tally of 190 million at the box office. Having seen the success that the TV version of the original brought them, the Selkines decided to repeat the process and release a version that featured more than 24 minutes of new footage. Like the first film, none of this footage adds to the overall story and essentially just extends scenes. Adding to the confusion, there are many different TV versions depending on the country of origin. 
Some countries even omitted most of the violence at the White House, while including these extra flourishes, which amounts to dozens of varied versions of the television release. Still, the many different TV versions are highly sought after due to these inclusions and exclusions. Speaking of different versions, the story behind Donner being removed from the film was the stuff of legends in movie and comic book circles. The legendary Donner cut took on a mythical status, with fans even releasing Superman 2 Restored International Cut, which took scenes from the TV version and international versions of the film to get it as close to Donner's original vision as possible. This was met with legal action from Warner Brothers, so the idea of a legitimate cut seeing the light of day grew smaller by the second. Until a certain interview with Margot Kidder and a new Superman film being in production. Kidder had stated in an interview that there was a version of Superman 2 that Donner shot that was much better than what was released in theaters. While fans had been hoping to see this for years, it was Margot's inference that the film was simply waiting in a Warner Brothers vault waiting to be found that sent fans into a frenzy. One of such fans just happened to be creating a new vision of Superman, Brian Singer. Singer had such a love for the Reeve Superman films that he wanted his version to be a continuation of that story, ignoring the events of 3 and 4. Due to this, Singer wanted to use elements from the original films that hadn't been used. And so the vault was accessed, revealing a treasure trove of footage. In fact, all of the film that Donner shot was in such good shape that some of the footage of Brando was used in Singer's Superman Returns. Seeing how much excitement had drummed up at the idea of returning to Donner's Superman world via Singer's vision, Warner Brothers decided it was time to compile the old footage and give the fans what they wanted. With Singer producing, Donner was brought back along with Mankiewicz to complete his edit of the film. The Donner cut was no longer myth. While we've gone over the many differences between the two versions, Donner has stated that he would have included a different ending if he had been able to film it back in the day. But he maintains that the film is as close to his original vision as you can get. Warner Brothers released the Donner cut on DVD and Blu-ray in 2006, alongside the release of Superman Returns. In the years since, like his contemporaries, Terrence Stamp appeared in the TV show Smallville as the voice of Jor-El. Sarah Douglas showed up more recently on the show Supergirl as a Kryptonian named Jinda Kolraz, and while he hasn't appeared on any Superman-related content since, Jack O'Halloran appeared on the podcast How Did This Get Made, and told many stories about his time on the set of Superman, including having to put Christopher Reeve in his place. It's worth a listen if you're interested in more behind-the-scenes gossip. Despite the production of Superman 2 having a layer of controversy, the successful results cannot be denied. Whether you prefer the original theatrical version or the Donner cut, the film has something for everybody. Superhero team-ups have existed in comic books since their inception. Whether it's Superman and Batman, Green Lantern and Green Arrow, mashing together two popular characters is always a way to ramp up the excitement. So when approaching the Christopher Reeve Superman, who could possibly match his natural charisma and magnitude? Why, Richard Pryor, of course! That's right, today on DC Revisited, we're taking a look at one of the strangest team-ups in film history with Richard Lester's Superman 3. If you've been watching our series, you've seen that it's been no easy task getting Superman to the big screen. Given the mess of a production that Superman 2 was, producers needed to get things in order behind the scenes. But before we can get into the Superman 3 that we did get, we first need to look at what Donner's original plan for the film was. Richard Donner had originally intended on making four Superman films. He would direct the first two, then he would pass directing duties onto his writer, Tom Mankiewicz, while Donner would help with scripting. He even planned on Brainiac being the main villain for the third film. Once he was fired, however, all plans seized and Mankiewicz left with him. The Selkines, not having any of their creative assets in place outside of Richard Lester, decided to move forward anyway. You may have noticed just how powerful the Selkines are when it comes to this franchise. 
One of the craziest facts to come up when it comes to Superman 3 is that it's an independent film. Sure, it's ridiculously expensive, but by definition of the word, it's still entirely independent. Warner Brothers provided the distribution, but the money for the production was entirely put up by the Selkines. Alexander and Ilya also owned the TV rights. Due to this, the Selkines had unimaginable control over the series. And because of that, they made some rather... interesting decisions. Alexander and Ilya Salkine did not want to just repeat the same beats of the first film. With the success of Star Wars and Star Trek moving into film, Ilya wanted to go further into the sci-fi and comic book space. So, likely taking a bit of inspiration from Donner, Ilya wrote an outline where Superman teams up with Supergirl in order to defeat Brainiac and Mr. Misselplik. Brainiac would troll Superman at one point and make him turn bad. Sounds like a pretty interesting story, right? Well, Salkind was going to have Superman and Supergirl oblivious to the fact that they're related, and then develop a romance between the two of them. So, if you were thinking that the one thing missing from Superman was incest, then you're on the same page as Ilya. Thankfully, everyone else involved felt this was crazy and decided to go in a different direction. However, some elements of Salkind's outline remained. While Brainiac was excised, the idea of a supervillain controlling Superman and forcing him to do evil things was not. While producers felt that setting up a character to control soups would be too difficult for children to understand, they used pre-established canon of Kryptonite being his one weakness and altering it slightly. Richard Pryor got his job from an interview on Johnny Carson where he proclaimed his love for Superman 2. They even wrote the script completely around his participation. To the point that Richard Pryor actually feels like the lead character, not Superman. Salkind has defended this choice by stating that this is simply an episode in the saga of Superman rather than one of the pillars of his journey. But it's still one of the most common criticisms. The Salkinds went to two of their writers from the first two films, David and Leslie Newman. If you remember, these were the two that provided most of the hamminess that Donner would bring Tom Mankiewicz in to get rid of. So while their names are involved in the first, none of their actual work was used. They then provided the rewrites for Lester's reshoots of Superman 2. But given Lester's tone and Pryor's involvement, producers were hoping that the Newman's comedic sensibilities would be a perfect combination. Richard Lester actually makes some very interesting choices here. Unlike the second film, where they were trying to blend the work of Donner's with Lester's newly shot footage, here the film is 100% Lester's. As the viewer, this makes for much less jarring transitions between aesthetics. Now the entire film is established with Lester's long static takes. There's more of a cohesiveness in style since all of the elements align for the entire movie. That's not entirely a good thing, though. Christopher Reeve returned to his role of Superman and his alter ego, Clark Kent. But it took some convincing. He hadn't been happy with how Richard Donner was fired from the second film. Especially given that Donner helped with his casting, and he had been relatively unknown at the time. Then there was the script. Reeve would later write about Newman's scripting style in his autobiography. In one scene in this script, Superman would be in pursuit of Lex Luthor, identified by his bald head, and grab him, only to realize he had captured Telly Savalas, who would remark, Who loves you, baby? and offer Superman a lollipop. Reeves' concerns that the Newmans were making Superman just as campy as Adam West's Batman seemed to be true, so he turned down the third film. Given how close to the start of production they were, the producers immediately went on a search for a new Superman. Jeff Bridges and Kurt Russell were considered, and John Travolta was even approached, but he ultimately turned it down. Just days before cameras were set to get rolling, Tony Danza was cast as Superman. Um, excuse me, what? Thankfully, that was the same reaction as Richard Lester, who was horrified at Salkine's decision. 
In desperation, Lester contacted Reeve again, begging him to reconsider. He said he would, but only if he was given more input on the script. The dispute was settled, and Reeve still suited up as the Man of Steel. Superman 3's story should almost be looked at as a spin-off. The movie mostly follows Richard Pryor's Gus Gorman's climb up the corporate ladder. I'm not kidding, he goes from unemployed to scamming his company to creating a kryptonite alternative in no time whatsoever. His tenacity is unmatched. Heck, his plan against the company is even reused in office space. But Peter, that's not much money. That's the beauty of it. Each withdrawal, it's a fraction of a cent. That's too small to notice. But you take a few thousand withdrawals a day, you space it out over a couple of years, that's a few hundred thousand dollars. It's like Superman 3. Superman himself has considerably less to get up to in this film. He rescues a few people, goes to a class reunion, and turns into a bad guy. And how does the ultimate good guy turn bad? Well, Gus creates synthetic kryptonite and replaces a key element that he can identify with tar from cigarettes. So it's smoking that turns Superman bad. Ugh, you really can't make this stuff up. Eventually, Superman turns into two different people and fights himself in a junkyard. It's the highlight of the movie, and it's over before you even can know what hits ya. As you can probably expect, Superman saves the day, and even gets Gus a new job in the process. It's a weird ending. It's not a surprise that some of the cast had reservations about the story. Most of the main cast from the previous two films returned here. Now that he no longer had to share screen with giant stars like Gene Hackman and Marlon Brando, Christopher Reeve received top billing for the first time in the series. Reeve was at the absolute peak of his physical form here, and really felt he had a command of the role. While the Clark Kent that he presented in the first two films is rather bumbling and clumsy, the Clark here seems to have found his footing in the world a bit more. There's still some of those trademark ticks, but he mostly presents Clark as a much more confident person than he was prior. A growth that often goes overlooked. While only appearing briefly, Margot Kidder does return as Lois Lane, as does Jackie Cooper as Perry White. But the member of the Daily Planet who gets the largest bump in screen time is Jimmy Olsen, played by Mark McClure, accompanying Clark during his trip back to Smallville. Photographer always goes after a story. While it was rumored for years that Gene Hackman refused to return to the role due to his relationship with Donner, this only applied to his work on Superman 2. In regards to the rest of the series, Hackman felt that he shouldn't be the sole villain for Superman to face, so he declined to return in this film. Given that Hackman later returned for his role in Superman 4, this seems to ring true. In lieu of Lex Luthor, Robert Vaughn took on the role of Ross Webster. He was already rather famous from his role in Man From U.N.C.L.E. Frank Langella was actually Salkine's first choice for the villain role. He wanted him as he was much more unknown, and he felt that would service the role better. Instead, the studio preferred to have a more famous face and asked Vaughn to be cast. The Selkines relented, as Warner didn't often have big demands of them. While the role is really similar to Lex Luthor, he almost feels like a Bond villain, especially with his grand base, over-the-top plan, and ridiculous ski resort on top of a skyscraper. Never mind, he's literally just Lex Luthor, except instead of underground, he's high in the sky. Oh well. Webster's sister, Vera, played by Annie Ross, provides one of the most insane moments of the series as she gets turned into a cyborg after being pushed into a supercomputer. It's like it was written by a child. Instead of Miss Tessmacher, we have Lorelei, played by Pamela Stevenson. The main point of her character seems to be visual stimulation? Given that Ilya Salkine swears by this being a kid's movie, this character's wardrobe choice is hilarious and confusing. When Clark and Jimmy visit Smallville, a few people from Clark's past spring up. Lana Lang, played by Annette O'Toole, and Brad, played by Gavin O'Harely. You may remember these characters as the 30-year-old high school students from the original film, now played by different actors. Well, now they're even more grown up and apparently still dating, despite Brad being a massive jerk. 
One of the key differences with this film versus the others, outside of quality, is the love interest. While Margot Kidder's Lois Lane took up most of Clark's affections in the first two films, he instead pursues his high school sweetheart, Lana Lang. Rumors have persisted for years that Kidder was replaced due to her voicing her displeasure over Donner's firing. Salkine claims that this wasn't the case though, and they simply felt that the relationship had come to a logical end. Having already introduced Clark's high school sweetheart, Lana, in the first film, the character seemed primed as the next love interest. While it's easy to be cynical regarding this explanation, it also makes a lot of sense. Why bring back their relationship after wrapping it up in the previous film? They needed time away from each other. Otherwise, Clark's sacrifice at the end of 2 is for nothing. The opening credits here are very different and set the tone early. The first two films featured extraordinary views of traveling through space, really setting up the grand nature of this story. While we are given the same credit design, the backdrop is considerably less impressive. And it seems to go on forever. It's just bit after bit. So if there's any question the viewer had regarding the film's tone, that is answered within the first few minutes. While most of the locations are rather bland, the Chemical Factory is an absurdly impressive set piece when you see how practical it is. Shot at a brand new chemical factory, the pyrotechnic crews set up just outside the zone of some very flammable gas. So when you watch this scene, just know that all it would have taken was for the winds to shift and send some errant embers in that direction, and the whole place would go up in a ball of flame. Crazy. When production finally wrapped in Pinewood Studios in London, the Selkines thought they had a surefire hit. With the popularity of both the Superman character as well as Richard Pryor, spirits were high. Ken Thorne returned to score the music, which doesn't manage to stand out outside of the reused John Williams score. Fresh off the success of Flashdance, Giorgio Morador was brought in to provide some music, but his contributions were barely used in the finished product. He even completed a full synthesizer version of Main Title March from Superman 2, and it sounds weird. Never underestimate the power of computers. The flying effects here are really impressive, and it's clear that Reeve really has the body language of flight nailed down, which makes Superman's lack of screen time even more frustrating. Superman 3 opened on June 17, 1983, to a total weekend gross of $13.3 million. This was only just shy of Superman 2's $14 million, so the studio was happy. Unfortunately, the film didn't manage to keep that success going, and wrapped up its worldwide run with $81 million, well short of the $100 million plus grosses of the first two films. It's no surprise given that audiences were mixed and critics hated it. The most common criticisms were the lack of Superman, the overt campiness, and the focus on Richard Pryor. Even looking at the theatrical trailer, Pryor is treated as the main character, and Superman feels like more of a participant. While Pryor was a very popular comedian at the time, people going to see a Superman film were going for the guy in the cape, not Pryor. So the criticisms should have been expected. But it wasn't just critics that disliked the film. Christopher Reeve openly lambasted it, saying that he would never take on the role of Superman again. Like the first two films, a TV version was produced that featured extra footage. Taking criticisms into account, producers replaced the opening credits with a more traditional credit scroll in space. Fans don't seem to share the same reverence for this TV version as they do the others. And with scenes like this, who can blame them? Over the years, the film has received a fair share of criticism. Showing up on bad movie podcasts and being derided by its stars have almost gotten this film a mythical status, which is impressive given that it's not even the worst film in the franchise. But we'll get into that in a few episodes. The film is currently available on Blu-ray as well as the streaming service HBO Max. 
Richard Pryor left the comic book world and returned to the world of comedy until his unfortunate passing in 2005. Annette O'Toole actually starred as Martha Kent on the TV show Smallville. This is clearly the most involved any of these actors has been with DC since the Reeve films, given that the other actors that pop up in this series are nothing more than cameo roles. Christopher Reeve's Superman has always been a symbol of hope. I say this to remind you of all the good things that Reeve's Superman provided us over the years. Because it's time to get into the bad. In today's DC Revisited, we're looking at the film that briefly ended the franchise with Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. Ilya and Alexander Salkind were the shepherd of the Superman series since the beginning. Their love for the character and control of all aspects has been well documented in this series so far. But with the failures of both Superman 3 and Supergirl, the Salkinds began to question their involvement. Taking a break from the superhero genre, they produced Santa Claus the Movie, which was also a commercial failure. Under intense financial pressure, and thinking the superhero genre had run its course, the Salkinds sold the rights to the character at the Cannes Film Festival to the Canon Film Group. If you're not quite aware of the Canon Film Group, let's do a brief summary. Canon dominated the cheap movie scene in the 80s. Headed by Menachem Golan, Canon was producing upwards of 40 films a year. And how did they manage that when other much larger studios produced considerably less? Well, by keeping their budgets absolutely microscopic. If you wanted your movie made cheap, then they were your people. So you could say that Superman was now in questionable hands. Christopher Reeve had been so angry at the handling of Superman 3 and wasn't comforted by the efforts of Supergirl that it was still a question of whether or not he would even return to the role. Without a script in mind, the new producers approached Reeve with the idea that he would be able to craft the story himself. Not only that, but they would produce whatever he wanted for his next movie, and he would get a significant pay bump. And suddenly, like magic, Reeve had a change of heart, and was on board to return. But there were still many other elements that needed to be in place. Superman 2 and 3 director Richard Lester moved on from the directing gig, wanting to try something else. Reeve really wanted to step behind the camera himself, and even ended up directing some second unit stuff. But he was ultimately looked at as too inexperienced. Instead, eyes fell on Swamp Thing director Wes Craven. Craven was desperate to widen his portfolio and thought the superhero film could really showcase his talent. Unfortunately, star Christopher Reeve failed to get along with him and insisted he be replaced before filming got underway. Having just directed the film Iron Eagle, starring Lou Gossett Jr., Sidney J. Fury was brought aboard to direct. Cannon believed he could make an action movie for a reasonable budget, which was his main selling point. While Fury would jump at the opportunity, the highly stressful production nearly tanked his career. When it came to crafting a story, Cannon targeted young screenwriters Mark Rosenthal and Lawrence Connor, who had just written the box office hit The Jewel of the Nile, starring Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. Their understanding of both action and comedy made them the perfect candidates for a Superman film. Given his activism at the time, Reeve wanted the film to involve disarming the world of nuclear arms. The Cold War was still a hot-button topic, so all of the pieces seemed to align, even if it was a little on the nose. The story would entail Superman ridding the world of all of its nuclear arms and hurling them into the sun. Lex Luthor would return as the villain and create an evil clone of Superman named Nuclear Man, which he would then have to defeat. It's a pretty basic story, but after the failure of Superman 3, Getting back to the basics wasn't necessarily a bad thing. But Reeve wasn't the only one that had a bad time on Superman 3, and therefore didn't want to return. Lois Lane herself, Margot Kidder, had to be convinced that her role would be more significant than just a cameo. 
She grew to regret this decision, though, as her and Reeve often butted heads on set. She claimed Reeve's ego was out of control due to his having a hand in the story. The rest of the Daily Planet cast was brought back, with Jackie Cooper returning as Perry White and Mark McClure as Jimmy Olsen. But their scenes were brief. Miraculously, they were able to bring Gene Hackman back, and he seems to relish in the silliness going on around him. But they make the odd decision of cutting out most of his material. Originally in the first act, he was supposed to have failed attempts at making a nuclear man. He even creates this kind of Neanderthal version that is wearing, well, not much of anything. I'm going to assume they cut this scene because it's very distracting for a kid's movie. Instead of bringing back Ned Beatty or Valerie Perrin, the studio wanted someone younger as Lex's sidekick. So John Cryer was cast as Lex's nephew, Lenny. Cryer had just starred as Ducky in Pretty in Pink, so he was a huge get for them. He'd probably second guess this decision though once Christopher Reeve told him during production that the film would be terrible. But it was a good opportunity at the time. Originally, the writers wanted Christopher Reeve to play Nuclear Man, since he was supposed to be a clone of Superman. They felt this could further show off Reeve's dynamic range and make for a more interesting villain. But ultimately, this was nixed in favor of casting first-time English actor Mark Pillow. In order to forgo Pillow's accent and show the connection to Luthor, Hackman actually dubbed over all of Nuclear Man's lines. No, you have my voice. Feeling that they needed another female lead, Muriel Hemingway was brought in as the daughter of the new Daily Planet owner. Her character, Lacey Warfield, is an uppity New Yorker who has clearly been given everything by her father her entire life. Nuclear Man was originally supposed to have this weird obsession with Lacey that was an interesting through line. However, with all of the cuts, most of this ended up on the cutting room floor. So his kidnapping of Lacey really comes out of nowhere. And somebody probably should have told them that there's no gravity in space. The budget of the film was originally intended to be $36 million, which was similar to Superman 3. However, just before filming, Cannon entered intense financial turmoil and slashed the budget down to a mere $17 million. At less than half the budget of the prior films, Superman 4 was doomed from the get-go. Many key production members from the Superman series had been replaced by inexperienced Israeli crew that Cannon provided. One of the most egregious examples of budget cuts is the scene where Superman goes to the United Nations. What should be a thousand extras in the middle of a bustling city as Superman walks up the steps of the UN is downgraded to Superman walking in front of a few people and some pigeons on his way to an auditorium. It's very distracting. The effects work here can best be described as muddy. Every effect shot is so dark and inconsistent. Christopher Reeve's suit always looks faded against the dark backdrop of space. I mean, if this can even be considered space, because most of the time it's just black with no stars. Then there's the repeat shots. Trying to save more money, they constantly repeated flying shots and just stuck them in front of a different location. It becomes very distracting when they use it multiple times within a minute. I didn't edit that. That is literally just the same shot repeated over and over. Yikes. Usually the opening credits of a Superman film are a sight to behold. They are grand and epic, an absolute spectacle. So here we have, um, the complete opposite of that. This weird crayon looking text is what we receive instead, with little to no flourishes outside of the strange particle trail on the text. It serves as a warning for what's to come. While the production was rather schlocky, the writers still did their best to create a compelling story. They brought Clark back to Smallville, where his mother had passed and he has to decide what's to be done with the farm. It's a surprisingly grounded problem for someone dealing with such extraordinary circumstances. But the budget cuts reared their head yet again, and rather than filming on the original Kent farm, which was still available in Canada, they shot outside of England at a farm that looked nothing like the original one. 
yet another disconnect. Remember that scene from Superman 2 where Clark kisses Lois and she forgets pretty much the entire movie? Lois doesn't. Well, bad jokes aside, that power was brought back in this one, and he takes Lois's memory yet again. But it seems they really wanted to up Superman's game and gave him even more abilities. Yes, he can repair structures just by looking at them. Superman, Contractors Hayden. I'm sorry, Lois, but an emergency's come up, I'll have to go. There's a lot of potential with the double date between Superman and Lois and Clark and Lacey. In the hands of someone like Richard Donner, or heck, even Richard Lester, this would have been a comedy of errors with many close calls and tension of Clark being found out. Yet what's provided is just a slow-paced look at two women trying to date this guy. There's no fun miscommunication or anything. Clark doesn't even really seem like he's struggling much with the juggling act. The original edit of the film was 134 minutes and edited down to 89 minutes. This meant a ton of stuff ended up on the cutting room floor. What's left is, as Rosenthal described it, a nonsensical mess. Take this scene of Lex stealing a single strand of Superman's hair. We see it holding up a thousand pound weight. Must be pretty strong, right? Apparently not. Or else those shears are made from kryptonite. But why on earth would so much of the film be cut down? Well, a negative screening in Southern California of the 134-minute version caused Canon to rethink the film. This is the only time this version of the film was shown, and it was thought to be lost for many years. While it's unclear if this version would have been higher quality, according to Rosenthal, it actually made sense, which was better than the film we got. Original Star Trek composer Alexander Courage was brought in to do the music. Thankfully, Courage mostly sticks to adapting the Williams score, so the film still sounds distinctly Superman. But it's really hard not to feel bad for all the creative people involved in this production. It's clear that they just wanted to continue the Superman legacy properly, but the budget from canon just would not allow that to happen. Superman 4 The Quest for Peace opened in the United States on July 24, 1987. While past films had a strategy of staggered releases, this was released in most territories in July. And while Warner Brothers was in charge of the film's domestic release, Canon headed up international distribution. This meant the film had significantly less reach than the other Superman films, and resulted in a total box office of just $36 million. Word of mouth probably didn't help. We can be quite thankful for Superman 4's failure because it caused the Canon Group to abandon their plans to produce a Spider-Man film. It's not hard to imagine how that one would have turned out. In fact, after a ton of failures, Canon would go bankrupt just seven years later. This resulted in the Superman rights reverting back to their original owners, Alexander and Ilya Selkind. Oh, thank God, people who actually care about the character. The film has often been regarded as the red-headed stepchild of the Superman series. Reeve described it as simply a catastrophe from start to finish, which is hard to disagree with. While the film is included in the big Superman motion picture anthology Blu-ray set, it easily has the least amount of supplemental material compared to the other films. But where it impresses are the deleted scenes. 30 of the 40 minutes of the film that were cut out after the disastrous California screening can be found here. And they're a very interesting look into what the film could have been. While the effects work is clearly still very poor, you can see why everyone agreed to do this movie in the first place. It was a good story that was simply lost in the name of penny pinching. While we've discussed all the cameos these Superman actors have had on the show Smallville, the biggest return to the franchise was actually John Cryer. He would return to the DC Universe as Lex Luthor in the CW show Supergirl, and as the official Lex for the Arrowverse. So you could say that Lenny got quite the glow up. Unfortunately, 1995 saw Christopher Reeve become paralyzed from a tragic accident, and with this came the end of his Superman character. 
but Reeves still represented the same symbol of hope as he did when he donned the red and blue tights. His activism and drive were inspirations to not only the disabled community, but to society as a whole. His death in 2004 was not only saying goodbye to a wonderful person and actor, but it was saying goodbye to the first person that made us believe a man can fly. As our time with Christopher Reeve's Superman draws to a close, another superhero looms large. But that's a tale for next time. Join us, same movie time, same movie channel. <laughs>